Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element europium. I have a sample of it right here in this glass vial. Maybe a little bit hard for you to see, so let me uh, magnify it a bit. I put it on the scanner for you to give you a higher resolution view. It's a shiny silvery metal when kept inside the glass vial. But if you expose it to the air, europium quickly forms a greenish oxide coating. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to go and pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Europium is the 63rd element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 63 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. In 1896, French chemist Eugène Anatole de Marseille suspected samples of the recently discovered element samarium, the previous element in our web series, were contaminated with an unknown element. Five years later, in 1901, he was able to isolate the hidden element. He named it Europium, and for once, I don't think I need to explain the origin of the name. For the long and tortuous route to the discovery of Samarium, see the previous episode in this series. One source of the earlier rare earth elements is the mineral monazite. Monazite is a phosphate with lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, and neodymium as major substituting elements. It's usually found in the form of a sand with other constituents. India, Madagascar, and South Africa have large deposits of monazite sands. Another mineable source of many rare earths is the mineral bastnasite, which is a carbonate fluoride with lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, or yttrium as major substituting elements. Both monazite and bastnasite are mined for europium and other rare earth elements. One last mineral has the coolest name, xenotime. This is normally a yttrium orthophosphate, but other elements can take the place of the yttrium, including europium. Let's take a look at the rare earth content of the previous three minerals. You can see from this table, Europium is not a common element and is quite rare even among the rare earths, accounting for only 0.1 to 0.2% of bastnasite, 0.05 to 0.16% of monazite, and only 0.2% of xenotime. The amount of europium extracted per year is not very high. It's estimated that about 270 metric tons, or about 600,000 pounds per year, are mined. As with most elements, the price of europium varies widely with purity and the quantity you buy. 99% pure europium goes for about $31 per kilogram much cheaper than I'd expect given the small quantities mined and refined. That may have to do with the fact that the applications of this rare earth are limited, as we'll see, so not much is needed. Whether or not it's needed, it's still refined from all the other rare earths as a byproduct. Europium belongs to a row of elements known as rare earth metals, or lanthanides, since lanthanum is the first element in this periodic table row. Europium is the seventh element of this series. Technically, both scandium and yttrium are also included in this group, since they're both members of the same periodic table column. Both the lanthanide row and the actinide row below it actually fit in the two spaces after barium and radium. But if we displayed the table in this fashion, it becomes too long and unwieldy. 
Publishers don't appreciate this aspect ratio in a table or diagram. It makes it difficult to fit aesthetically in a book or on a poster. The element europium is fairly uncommon in the universe. It's almost rare enough to be truly a rare earth. Coming in as the 75th most abundant element in the universe by mass, that's about 0.5 parts per billion. At 68th, europium is extremely rare in the sun too, also at 0.5 parts per billion. It's the 69th most abundant element in meteorites, about 60 parts per billion. Surprisingly common compared to everywhere else, but still pretty rare. In the crust of the Earth, it's the 52nd most common element, almost two parts per million, about the same as uranium at 1.8 parts per million, directly to its left on this chart. Europium is the 75th most abundant element in the oceans, virtually non-existent at 0.13 parts per trillion. And lastly, and not surprisingly, there is no europium in us. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own, showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Europium is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just europium a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of europium created by various processes. The majority of europium present today is believed to be produced in supernovae, the yellow area. A fifth or sixth is produced in dying low mass stars, the magenta area, and a small amount, that green sliver on the top, is produced in neutron star mergers. Note, the europium produced by dying low mass stars, the magenta area, doesn't get started until a little bit later in the history of the universe. That's because low mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same. 63 protons for europium. But there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 38 known isotopes of europium. Of these 38, there are two stable non-radioactive isotopes, europium-151 and europium-153. These isotopes occur in nature in almost equal amounts, almost 48% and 52% respectively. Technically, europium-151 is not a stable isotope, but it has a very very long half-life, as we'll see in the next slide. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek, isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of europium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of europium, these 15 are the longest lived the ones with half-lives over one hour. More about half-lives in the next slide. The longest-lived isotope is europium-151, with a half-life of 4.62 times 10 to the 18th years. That's 4.62 million, million, million years, or almost 335 million times the age of the universe. 
you see that extremely little of this isotope has had enough time to decay significantly, which is why it still makes up almost 48% of naturally occurring europium. If you had a 1 kilogram sample of pure europium-151, you'd observe only one atom decaying every two minutes on the average. That would be a very challenging measurement to make. There are about four septillion atoms in a kilogram. That's a four followed by 24 zeros. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide. You'll see why I chose 1,024 atoms. Hint, it's a power of 2, and we'll be doing a lot of dividing by 2. If you wait one half life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Europium has a medium density at 5.244 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up some more densities for you here. You can see europium is a bit more dense than titanium. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself. But we'll have to wait to do this until we're back face to face. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, europium's density is 5.244 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle just above titanium. It has the lowest density of the lanthanide series elements. Europium has a fairly low melting point at 822 degrees Celsius or 1512 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils at 1527 degrees Celsius or 2781 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 705 degrees Celsius above its melting point. Not a huge difference. If we compare the size of the europium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The europium atom is almost 4.4 times the size of hydrogen. Those two outer electrons are held fairly loosely. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are small. Here are atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Europium has the eighth largest size atom of the elements. All the rare earths are fairly large. I'll mark the other lanthanides in blue. Note how they're all clustered towards the top of the chart. They're all fairly large atoms. Europium is a fairly soft element coming in at 3 on Mohs scale of hardness, about the same as copper. I've encountered other sources that say it has a hardness similar to lead, which is much softer. Thanks to the YouTube channel Thoisoy, cutting a piece of europium with electrical pliers, it looks to me like the hardness is more similar to copper than lead. Here's a chart of element hardness from the hardest, boron on the left, to the softest, 
cesium on the right. Europium with a hardness of 3 is pretty soft, about the same as copper, as I mentioned previously. Europium has the fifth highest rate of thermal expansion, about 35 parts per million per degree Celsius. This means that if you had a one meter long bar of europium and you heated it by one degree Celsius, it would get longer by 35 millionths of a meter, or about one or two hair widths. Europium expands one and a half times as much as aluminum and three times as much as iron. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Europium has a weak set of emission lines, except for some stronger blues. When you put europium in a flame, it creates the oxide with a beautiful red flame test color. This surprises me given the lack of strong red emission lines we saw in the previous slide, but the oxide is not the same as the pure metal. Let's take a look at a few applications of this rare earth element. One notable quality of europium salts, in this case europium sulfate, is that they can be made to fluoresce. Under white light, it's a clear whitish powder. Under ultraviolet light, europium sulfate glows a bright red. It also glows red when excited by colliding electrons. We can make use of that. Europium not only fluoresces, it's also an ingredient in glow-in-the-dark phosphorescent powders. These are available from one of my favorite geek websites, United Nuclear. Remember when TVs used to look like this? Europium phosphors play an important role in making color televisions. Europium is especially good at glowing red. Most color TVs of this type contain from one half to one gram of europium oxide. Here's how it worked. Electrons boiled off the heated cathode in the neck of the tube are accelerated, focused, and bent to strike red, green, and blue phosphors coated on the inside surface of the tube's face. Those phosphors are coated in stripes or dots on the inner surface of the tube. Combining the red, green, and blue colors creates the appearance of any color from where we sit watching the television. Europium phosphors made this possible. The same phosphors are coated on the inside of glass tubes of fluorescent lamps. By varying the amounts of each color phosphor, the manufacturer can change the quality of the light produced, from warm white to cool white to daylight. Incorporate those phosphorescent powders into inks, and you make money harder to counterfeit. When placed under ultraviolet light, complicated parts glow in specific colors. Appropriate that the red glowing europium phosphors are part of this 50 euro note. This doesn't make it impossible to counterfeit, just harder and more expensive. There are other anti-counterfeiting devices also built into bills, especially the larger denominations. Europium-doped lasers can emit a red beam. Here you see a europium-doped glass rod excited with a green laser. One last glowing thing, a mineral called Blue John, found in England, can have a slight impurity of europium that causes it to glow an eerie blue color when illuminated with ultraviolet light. CAF2, or calcium fluoride, is called fluorospar. The mineral gave its name to the phenomenon of fluorescence. If you're building a nuclear reactor, you want tight control of the fission process going on inside the reactor core. Fission of the uranium atom happens when it's hit by a stray neutron. The extra neutron destabilizes the nucleus, which then splits into two smaller, lighter nuclei, while also releasing a few additional neutrons. The additional neutrons are now free to cause more uranium to fission. Since many neutrons are released, and each can cause the uranium atom to fission, the reaction can grow exponentially. 
an uncontrolled, exponentially increasing release of energy may be what you're after if you were developing a nuclear weapon. If you're after something more controlled, you need to absorb a critical number of neutrons to generate energy in a more even and continuous fashion. Some elements, like cadmium, europium, and other rare earths, are very good neutron absorbers. In a nuclear reactor core, control rods made of these absorbing elements are interspersed among the uranium fuel rods. Pulling the rods out of the core allows more neutron reactions to take place, heating up the core. You use this heat to generate steam to turn turbines. Pushing the rods into the core slows the reaction, cooling the reactor. Your body does not use europium, but it's relatively non-toxic compared to many other metals. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about europium. Defending euros, contained in every banknote, glowing in UV. In the next program in this series, we'll examine another magnetic element, gadolinium. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about europium.